Hello and welcome to the long-awaited next episode of Deceptive Methods. So we have been gone for a while because we had a lot of family issues come up. Um, we had family health issues and then my grandfather passed away. And uh, Holidays? Holidays. It's been a lot. Yeah, it's been a lot going on. And um, also, I, I really hate working on deadlines. Mm. It makes me anxious and then I get or, or panicky and, and anxious and then I get to the point where I, I just don't do anything. <laughs> I feel like I'm just going to make the podcast when I'm able to, you know, because nobody's paying me. Agreed. Not even me. Yeah, nobody is paying. So uh, I have been slowly working on this episode for a while. Um, it's been really enjoyable, really interesting. Um, if we do want to say this is a podcast about historical conspiracies, yes. deceptive methods. We can say that at any time, yep. even even now. Everything's mm -hmm. okay. That's Everything's fine. fine. <laughs> um, I feel like this topic is a part of our Western collective history knowledge. And I'm pretty sure that this topic is going to be one that most people, if not everyone, will know about, at least by name. What we will be discussing today is warrior monks. Mm. One could say is an oxymoron, uh, but the warrior monk did exist during the Crusades, could also say the Crusades themselves seemed against everything that Jesus stood for. So warrior monks aren't that much of a stretch, you know, because nearly everything about the Catholic Church is hypocritical anyway, especially True. the history. Yes. So, I mean, you know, why not? Uh, and if you haven't guessed already, or have you guessed already? I have not. Okay. <laughs> well, we're going to discuss the Knights Templar. Oh, well, okay. That makes sense. Yes. That was, a, that did hit my mind, but it wasn't like a, oh, yeah. I'm guessing this will be the Knights Templar. I was like, oh, kind of like the Knights Templar. No, yeah. Push yes. the on switch, mm -hmm. put our thinking caps on. I know that the Templars are basically a conspiracy in themselves, mm. like just their entire being. And they pop up in all kinds of magical, unexplained events. And, you know, they're guardians of the Holy Grail. And they are a mystical and magical organization that has survived the test of time by being so dang interesting. Or have they? I think so. Everything in video games and movies. Yeah. They're just, they're still. so ingrained in our Western culture. I wonder if there's an equivalent in, in Asian cultures of the Templars. Maybe the samurai. Probably the samurai are, are samurai a little so, bit. Similar. The samurai are so weird because the samurai were all about their bows and yeah. fight, and fighting from horseback, and the the sword was only a fallback for if you were bad with your bone. It was shameful to have to use it, but the way theater works, obviously, it's way easier to fake using a sword than it is to fake shooting an arrow at someone. Yeah. So that's sort of how samurai became super popular as swordsmen, even though they were using like really crappy iron that would just shatter if you hit the wrong way, which is why they had to. And, and they were they, they were more of a and... uh, guerrilla warfare, but they were also they also had a code, and mm -hmm. they you know they were kind of an organization. I don't know, it's kind of it's the kind same. of like ninjas too, where ninjas weren't really a thing except for oh, the, right. the stagehands were all dressed in black, and then people were like, oh shit, we can yeah, use actually, them. Actually, yes, I was confused. It's the ninjas that were guerrilla. Yeah. Ninjas were the like the and and a, a real ninja would just be someone who was just dressed like a local and tried to blend. Don't in. get Jesse started on ninjas and samurais. It's just, I understand why they were changed for theater. I just wish it would have been properly represented at some point in movies. Yeah, I think everything that is that old is eventually just going to get watered down and misrepresented like we're going to learn now. Ooh. So, Neat. in reality, the Templars were a religious military order sanctioned by the Pope and the Church. The Church with a capital C. And their purpose was watching over pilgrims and people who were traveling during the Crusades. They also helped to transport pilgrims over the seas. Hmm. They were also closely aligned with another military order of the Knights Hospitaller. Have you ever heard of that? I have not. Really? Okay. They ran hospitals and places of refuge to traveling pilgrims. So they were also just a, a religious sanctioned order ah, for the Crusades. Got it. The Templars are seriously the most mythological institution in Christianity. And to quote the abstract of one of the articles I read, quote, in a strange twist of fate, the defamation and destruction of the Templars in the 14th century has given them an afterlife in the popular imagination that has reached all corners of the world, far surpassing the reach of the medieval order. 
given the relative brevity of the existence and the fact that they ultimately failed in their mission, what was it about the Templars that has kept us fascinated for centuries? The lies that were built up around them? You know, it, it, ha it tends to happen. Yeah. After 700 years. A little bit. Okay, so let's um, discuss beginnings. In 1099, after three years, an army of Christians managed to conquer Jerusalem in the First Crusade. And if you don't know, um, yes, that is correct, that for decades there were ethnic European Christian kings of Jerusalem. And after that, there was a presence in some form for a couple centuries. I didn't know this myself before my I took um crusade course in history, and I, I was shocked to find out that I didn't know. And I read that behemoth book, God's War, which has been sitting around me for the past two or three months. Mm. You've noticed probably. Yes. Um, and I remember when I read that in 2011, and um, that was during our road trip where we went up to Massachusetts mm -hmm. for you to get some of your things. And, and you'd meet the family and me to say yeah, goodbye forever. Do, yeah, do all kinds of nice things and wrap things up. And you were like, you have to read all of that because I was like frantically, like anxiously reading this mm -hmm. like thousand page book. And you're like, do you have to read all that? And yes, I did have to read all of that because <laughs> history degrees don't fuck around. This mm. was a summer course and I had to read a thousand page book. So the, fir the first crusade had been a call to action in 1096 by Pope Urban II. It began as European aid to the Byzantine Empire, the part of Rome that survived the fall of Western Rome in 476 AD. And the lands that the Christian armies captured were supposed to go back to the Byzantine Emperor. And centuries before, the Islamic people had conquered the area and the Byzantines and the European Christians wanted it back. <laughs> But after the alliance broke down, the Christians decided to take the land for themselves and set up kingdoms known as the Crusader States. Oh, what a shock. The, yeah. Whoa. <laughs> no. The largest state was the Kingdom of Jerusalem. The Kingdom of Jerusalem was a lot larger and encompassed Israel, Palestine, and large portions of Jordan and Syria on today's Eesh. map. So it was really big. Mm. I mean, the Christians wouldn't want it unless it was really big, right? In Jerusalem, a holy order was born from the perceived threat against Christian pilgrims traveling to the Holy Land after the First Crusade. After the Christians successfully invaded Jerusalem, the pilgrims started a coming. They wanted to be there. The, the Muslims started a targeting Whoa. Christians specifically. They were targeting, of course they were. Clerics in the Muslim world were calling for attacks against the Christians as they were perceived as part of the problem, AKA what else is new? You know, sorry to modern Christians, but Christians were part of the problem and they would be part of the problem and they have continued to be part of the problem for 1500 years. It's been a lot. You know, when they first started up, they weren't so bad. But, you know, after it's kind of been you rough. Know, after your first hundred years, you have to start like getting things going with making yourself powerful, which also means making yourself corrupt. However, it was known back then that the first crusade was invoked, according to Pope Urban II, for the plight of Eastern Christians the molestation of pilgrims and the desecration of the holy places. So that's why it was called forth because all those issues were happening. But a lot of the Muslim attacks and massacres on Western pilgrims occurred after the crusades, not before. So there was a particular post crusade occurrence that was the prompt to find a new beefy Christian order. Beefy. They needed to fill a hole. Needed to fill that hole with beef. After the conquest, pilgrims started to flood into the Holy Land, obviously, because they could now. And one group of about 300 pilgrims arrived in Jerusalem in time for Easter in 1119. And this group witnessed the miracle of the fire in the Holy Church of the Sepulcher. And this was a magical flame that appeared on Christ's tomb. Magical. It is considered one of the greatest of all Christian miracles. Ooh. And since it happens every year, it is also one of the oldest Christian scheduled miracles in the world. <laughs> scheduled. Yes, yeah, scheduled miracle. After the pilgrims witnessed this miracle, they were inspired by religious zeal to bathe in the River Jordan where Christ was baptized. But when they left the safe confines of the city, they were slaughtered by Muslim bandits. Ooh. At the end, 300 were killed and 60 were held as prisoners for ransom. A miracle. <laughs> Baldwin II, king of Jerusalem, he sent a group of knights to go after the attackers, but they were long gone. After this, a French knight 
rescue to Pan asked King Baldwin for permission to start a new monastic order. This order would be similar to the Knights Hospitaller, but this order would be specifically to guard pilgrims and keep them safe on the routes to Jerusalem. The knights wouldn't only be monks, but warrior monks. Mm. That that will be paladin to you, gamer sir. Yes. Baldwin II granted Hugh's request, and the order was born in 1119. In 1120, Baldwin had to get all of these random motley group of knights out of the Church of the Holy Sepulchre, which had become really crowded, and he gave them their own headquarters. They were gifted the old palace, it was serving at a, as a palace of the kings of Jerusalem after the conquest. But the palace was on the Temple Mount, not far from the Dome of the Rock. You know, the big the big gold one mm -hmm. that you might have seen in school. And yes. the palace, quote unquote, was actually a Muslim mosque called al Aska Mosque, which is the third holiest site in Islam. So the kings were using this mosque as a palace. They gave it to this new order as their headquarters. Sure, that went over well. Yeah, because of location and the grand architecture, they called the mosque the Temple of Solomon. And this is where this order became the poor fellow soldiers of Christ and the Temple of Solomon. Mm. The poor it fellow soldiers, right the poor fellow soldiers of Christ and the Temple of Solomon, or the Order of know. Solomon's Temple, or the Knights Templar, or the Templars. So we just kind of boil it down a mm. little bit. However, the al Aska Mosque was not the Temple of Solomon. It was built near where it is, or thought to be where the temple once stood, but either way, it's not the same temple. This is a first of many pseudo-histories about the Templars. Ooh. The Knights were called the Poor Fellows because in the beginning, the Templars were not a wealthy order at all. They must have, oh, you know what, I'm probably going to head myself, but I'm going to guess they stole a lot of stuff from people. Um... I don't think, actually, I don't think so. Oh, they just got money from um, the church. I'm just so I used mean, to people just always robbing each other and then... Because their their purpose wasn't to, like, attack. I mean, not in the beginning. It was not to, like, be an army and attack people. It was just to protect. But besides the fact that they were given a, a, a mosque as their headquarters, mm. I mean, maybe a little bit of, of stealing. Well, I mean, that's just the history of the church. Right. So, I mean, we couldn't have... We couldn't have this without some theft. Uh, an early seal showed two knights sharing one horse. And these knights were really considered monks, like really, really considered monks. And they took the monastic vows of celibacy, obedience, Ugh. and poverty. Ugh. Well, which, I mean, that doesn't supposed count. to be the thing with Christianity that just never actually happened. Celibacy doesn't, it never counts. It doesn't count. No. A vow of poverty is circumnavigated by the order because it's the knights themselves who take the vow, not, not the, the order. order. Yeah, <laughs> always something. Under that loophole, the order or the monastery or the abbey or whatever religious institution it may be is free to acquire vast amounts of wealth. So kind of like today's capitalistic society, like the people who do the work are poor while the institution is wealthy. Mm -hmm. Bernard de Clairvaux, a.k.a. St. Bernard, was a writer oh. and preacher. And as a religious celebrity in his day, mm -hmm. what we call a religious influencer who wanted to get the Holy Knights trending, he gave the Templars some free publicity in the late 1120s to early 1130s after Hugh visited him while on a tour of Europe to gain members. Bernard wrote an opinion piece about how the Templars were a great thing and justified the importance of religious monks, despite the fact that there were people who didn't understand why a religion of peace would need warriors. He believed regular old secular knights were pointless and needlessly violent mm -hmm. and thirsty for empty glory. Also, they were too into feminine locks, <gasps> such as silk, gold, long and full tunics, cumbersome sleeves, and he points out that they had tender, delicate hands. <laughs> Sounds like this guy was just jealous. <laughs> On the other hand, Templars were noble and answering a higher calling. They weren't immortal. They weren't immoral, not immortal. <laughs> they weren't immoral. They weren't immortal like the, like the seculars. <laughs> the Templars, on the other hand, shun excess in clothing which is in their case worn and torn their hair was short in conformity with the apostle saying that it is shameful for a man to cultivate flowing locks so <laughs> we need to warn jeff grubb oh, that he's guy. he's not he just cut it all off did you see oh right yeah. well you know he knew, see he knew the story was coming so he's like oh shit, i gotta get rid of it now he can be a I templar be he can be a templar safely i don't want to be a moral lady 
The Templars also seldom wash and never set their hair. They are content to be tousled and dusty, bearing the marks of the sun and their armor. They seek to be formidable rather than flamboyant. (laughs) Bernard was greatly responsible for the legitimization and popularization of the Templar order. He pumped them up at councils and in writing, so it didn't take long for the Templars to become one of the wealthiest and well-supported charities of the day. Wealthy el- charities. Yeah. In 1129, he and Hugh drafted a formal rule for the Templars that was approved by the Council of Troy, which was the official acceptance of the order by the church. So, like, when they were setting up rules, like, that is, like, um, the vow, like, the vows and the and the rules that they took, but they just called a rule, like, the monastic rule. In 1139, Pope Innocent II officially decreed that the order was not beholden to any local king or lord, to any secular laws of the land, and only owed loyalty to the Pope. Along with the writing of St. Bernard, these special dispensations from the Pope meant that the Templars grew in prestige and numbers, and their mission grew from primarily protecting pilgrims to being the guardians and the general defense of Christian properties in the Holy Land. All over the Middle East, they started taking over strongholds and castles since they had the men and resources to do so. They eventually literally bought the island of Cyprus. Jesus. So I guess they did steal some things, you know. It was it's most kind of impossible not to when you're in that line of work, you know. Yeah, it's most it seems like mostly property, but that's still stealing. Yes. That's still stealing. But they did buy Cy- Cyprus. They didn't steal it. Mm. Eventually they were like they they slaughtered a whole bunch of Cyprians because Ooh. they they uprised. And then they're like, we can't deal with Cyprus. And then they try to like, they try to like void the deal. Like they bought it from like the King of England at the time. And they're like, um, we actually can't do this. Can we void that? Sorry. (laughs) Um, And they did, but they never said if they got their money back or not. (laughs) After the Pope's dispensation in the decades that followed, they started chapters all over Europe. And at their height, they inhabited over 1000 temples, AKA just fortifications that Mm. they called temples. Mm -hmm. Mm Mm-hmm. This was where they recruited men to serve in the Holy Land, and in between official crusades supported by kings, they kept pumping warriors to the Middle East. And during the crusades and battles, they padded the troops and were effective and well-trained mounted warriors that often determined the outcome. The Muslims considered them to be among the most significant forces in the Holy Land. The bane of the crusaders, Saladin, took Jerusalem in 1187, conquered the crusader states, and reduced them to cities that his successors eventually took over. However, the Templars would remain in the Holy Land for another century, and immediately they were heavily involved in the Third Crusade that ran from 1189 to 1192, which was an attempt by three European monarchs, France, England, and the Holy Roman Empire, to reconquer the Holy Land, and it was somewhat successful. In 1291, the last stronghold city of Christianity, Acre, was conquered and the whole of the city-states were completely destroyed. The Templars effectively ended their run in the Holy Land after 200 years. They were a constant protective presence during the Crusades and they seemingly had a great reputation among Christians in Europe as defenders of the faith and fighting the good fight. Mm. But during the last 50 years of the Templars' existence, the public opinion of the Templars wasn't favorable, wasn't that favorable. People thought that monks were required to live a contemplative life focused on the soul, not to fight a war. These the peop- soul thought of kicking ass. Yeah. These people thought that being warriors and also monks would lead to corruption. They were seen as greedy and were caught up in internal scandals. The Templars even made treaties with certain Muslim powers, and the people that hated them the most thought this was treason. Even though the agreements benefited the people, it was better than much worse happening if they didn't make the agreements, you know, as that's politics. Yeah. Um, In fact, one Templar was a blood brother with a sultan. They met when he was a prisoner and formed a bond that lasted a couple decades. They visited each other and used their friendship to form truces and agreements. The fall of Acre was blamed on them and the other military orders, although they were only one component of the Christian forces and hardly responsible for the entire failing of the Crusades, but they were easy to blame because in a way they represented the Crusades. They were a military organization literally made for the Crusades, so it seemed natural that they would take a big... They're they're all hyped up. When things go bad, they're going to get looked at. Yeah. After 1291, the Templars were still a super powerful, wealthy, and multinational organization. 
the first multinational organization. They were tax exempt and did not fall under secular law, thanks to the Pope. They argued their existence was still necessary because they were still guarding the Christian properties in the Holy Land. But since all the holdings were now gone by the early 1300s, why did they need to exist? I don't know. You tell me. I mean, n nobody knew. They were like, why? No, oh, just, <laughs> I guess it's one of those things like they had, so why not continue? Yeah. The Templar served a purpose to get people excited about going to the Holy Land, and then by extension, they could grow their numbers and also the Christian forces. The Templar order operated under its own Latin rule, and that was hastily translated into the local vernacular languages because every knight had to understand and consent to the rule. The Templar order was similar to the Benedictine order, or more specifically, the Cistercian order, which was a branch of the Benedictines. And this is why they could be considered warrior monks and were actually called this in their error, as quoted by our boy St. Bernard, the abbot of Clairvaux, and who was also the leader of the Cistercian reform. They are seen both more gently than lambs and more ferocious than lions. Okay. That, I that I almost doubt what I should prefer them to be called, namely monks or knights, unless I should call them, in fact, most suitably by both, in whom neither is known to be lacking, neither the gentleness of the monk nor the strength of the knight. And sure. <laughs> this monastic discipline was how they created their highly affected military strength. The Benedictines were kind of like the rich, popular kids in high school. <laughs> If you want to picture them like that, the Benedictines were the original monastic order and they and the Templars were both rigid in structure and rule. They both pledged absolute obedience to the abbot and for the Templars, the grand, ma the grand master, <laughs> like yikes. Mm -hmm. um, the similar. Grand Kliegel. They also wore white mantles with red crosses and sound sounds like something in the future, yeah. like the someone in the future, like the Lord of the Templars. Humility was also considered the monastic virtue. As soon as the master gave an order, it was to be considered the same as God's command. Any knight that exhibited pride and or didn't respond to discipline were to be ejected. The rigidness of the order was so important because in the Near East, more mobile Muslim knights would ambush on their swifter horses and with lighter armor. Breaking ranks could be deadly. No one could break ranks unless to quickly test equipment or to protect a Christian from an imminent attack from Muslims or lions. Or bears. Oh, my. Yeah. It was literally written in, in the rules that, that they could only break ranks for um, Muslims or lions or to protect a Christian. <laughs> sure. And they were only allowed to hunt lions, nothing else, so that hunting wouldn't be a distraction. So hunting was a really big part of the Middle Ages. So yeah, they're like, it was a pretty boring time. Yeah. They had to be sure that they're like, you can only hunt lions. What a weird thing. Is lion meat good? Um, or was it just for trophy hunting? No, they would, they would eat it. That was what they were hunting. They were only allowed to hunt the lions for some reason. Weird. However, no one was permitted to charge. Those closest to the danger were to arm and face the opponent, and behind them were supposed to report to the marshal for orders. The marshal's banner was the end-all be-all of the battle or attack. No knight for any reason could leave the battlefield as long as the standard was raised. If he was wounded, he had to get permission to fall back. It was important to maintain rank so that knights wouldn't be picked off. They also practiced the buddy system, the same as the Benedictines when leaving the monastery, so that one could always watch out for the other. By the end of the 1200s, there were thousands of Templar knights, and as much as 90% of them were non-combatant, and thousands of houses and castles across Europe. And they were essentially an early form of Europe's first banks with their pioneering financial techniques. Oh, boy. They could also be seen as the world's first multinational corporation. And with that being said, we always tend to forget the rest of the non-Western world, so... To be safe, I was going to say the first multinational organization in Europe and in the Middle East. But I tried to quickly look it up and see if there was any before that, but it didn't really pop up with anything. It just kept mm. coming up with like the East India companies. Oh, and I'm like, no, yeah. I'm talking about before that. So it, was, it wasn't it was that easy to look up quickly. Bit of a black hole for uh, history. You know, they called it the Dark Ages because... There wasn't that much reading and writing going on. It was basically all the monks, but it, it wasn't a dark age. It was... Yeah, there's was, a lot going on. We just don't know yeah. about it. History is not as complete as other ages, but it, it seems like it's out there. You just have to find it. During the journey to the Holy Land, there was a high chance of getting robbed or killed. 
And as you can imagine, it was a really, really dangerous journey. It wasn't out of the realm of possibility that once you arrived at the Holy Land to one of the Christian strongholds or cities, you might not ever get back home. Oh, geez. So the people would give their valuables to a Templar house for safekeeping. And this worked great if you were worried about being robbed while you were gone. And if something should happen to you, the Templars could execute a will. They helped you to write and be executor of your estate. They give everything to the Templars. No, they I know, I'm, I'm just kidding. Yeah, I know. They actually did run, they pioneered our modern banking system. So, mm -hmm. you know, it, it wasn't as bad as you think it might be. And to be the executor of your state, it was super because it would protect your valuables from sneaky relatives, local lords, or even Damn the king. Sack little baggins is trying to get everything. Or even the king trying to take over your possessions. The relatives whom you actually wish to get your wealth, should they hear of your death in the Holy Land, then they would go to the Templars who would read your will and then return your belongings to your family. Oh. The Templars also provided something equivalent to traveler's checks today. When you deposited your wealth at a local Templar house, they would give you a certificate that you could cash in at a house in the Holy Land. It, it was really like a modern day bank hmm. and also constantly guarded. And since they were an independent religious order, they weren't allied with any government or secular leaders. And this was a huge deal because the Templars could keep your wealth away from the people who were always trying to take your wealth. Yeah. So they're kind of like Swiss and Caribbean banks today, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> they serve the kings of England and France as their bankers, handling their deposits, money transfers, and tax collection. They were also able to provide huge ass loans to the kind of people who needed huge ass Huge loans. asses? Huge ass loans. Oh, yeah. So they, if you need how, many, like why a, do they, how do they have so many huge asses? If you need an ass loan, then you can go to them. One of these loans they provided was to King Louis VII during uh -huh. the Second Crusade. They basically paid for the whole thing, and this nearly bankrupted the Templars. The French monarchy struggled to pay back this loan, and it caused a huge rift between the French kings and the Templars, mm. subsequently creating a troubled relationship for decades. Those are the things that always break up relationships, money and women. And also, like, the Templars started kind of like a French thing, right? Because it was Hugh de Pan, which was a French guy. So, like, he kind of started in France, to, mm -hmm. like, for the, the initial order. The finances between the monarchy and the Templars became so entrenched that the chapter in the capital basically became the royal treasury. They also legitimized the place of the Templars in European culture, but also it would be the cause of their downfall. Philip IV, or Philip the Fair, because he was so handsome, was oh. seen as an aggressive, cold king who I'm upheld he really was harsh just policy. Not hideous, like most handsome. He was handsome. People. That meant that it, it was okay to be an asshole. Mm. Oh, of course. But he was seen as an aggressive, cold king who upheld really harsh policies and did not fuck around with anybody who messed with the king's authority and finances. He waged so many wars on England and Flanders that he was constantly needing funds. Ned Flanders. At one point, he basically laughed in the face of the Pope and started taxing churches and monasteries. <laughs> The Pope responded with a papal bull that said all kings had to ask the Pope's permission to tax churches. And this challenged the power of the Pope and who held the maximum authority, the Pope or the king? That's always been the question of the Middle mm -hmm. Ages. And that answer, they finally answered it and it's ne it never came up again throughout history. It was a nice clean answer. It's actually the king. <laughs> the yeah. king won. Philip started a smear campaign against Boniface VIII, who ended up holding a synod that decreed that all power came from God. Therefore, the power of God flowed through the Pope. They had to say it again. <laughs> they had to come to another synod to like say the thing that they were constantly saying. The Pope's issuing bulls and decrees was like his way of saying, because I said so. <laughs> Pretty much. Then Philip held his own meeting and decreed that he didn't have to listen to the Pope because he was a heretic that was guilty of fortune telling, <gasps> oh. sodomy, oh, and shit. having an independent relationship with a demon that lived in his ring. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> you know, like, don't mess around with Philip. He's going, as you see, he's going to. He will he's go going there. to. He's going to go there. Boniface eventually had to run for his life because things got so bad for him. Jeez. There are many examples that set up a pattern of Philip going after anyone who challenges his authority or messes with his money, or those who had money that he wanted. In 1306, Philip expelled 100,000 Jews from France. They were accused of witchcraft and desecration of Christian symbols and plots to defile various things holy to Christians. 
He set this up as, as like a defending the faith thing. But in reality, he took all the possessions to sell and took over all their debts so that payments went to him. God. He also offered 20% of anything found hidden away by the Jews to whoever found it. He also expelled Italians and Lombards, which are Germanic peoples that live in Italy. You know, once again, the Jewish people just having to deal with this bullshit. The Italians, Lombards, Jews, and the Templars were all leading factors in royal finance. And as foreigners, they were an easy target and they were safer to accuse. The Templars weren't necessarily foreign, but they were an international order and easier to attack all these groups of people than to tax the French people more. By 1307, Philip owed a huge amount of debt to the Templars. And since Philip was a dick, he accused the Templars of heresy and worshiping a severed demon head. A severed demon head this time? Yep. And on the fateful day of October 13th, 1307, Friday the 13th, as it was, Philip had his agents mass arrest thousands of Templars and charge them with heresy and other weird crimes. So, and also that this is one thing that they said Friday the 13th started as a bad luck day because it was the day the Templars were arrested, but that's not true. Ah, but out, out there, it's one of the things that people say. Mm -hmm. They're all wrong, lying jerk faces. Yeah. Don't believe people who with Friday the 13th conspiracies, okay? Mm -hmm. Even though they excelled at protecting pilgrims and provinces in Jerusalem while being vastly outnumbered in a hostile environment, they are seen as destined for failure. Towards the end, undermining the Templars' primary functional role was the decline of the crusading spirit. The end of the Templars is a huge part of the mythos surrounding the order. The arrested Templars were questioned by the king's officials, and sometimes they included churchmen. And this was odd because the charges were heresy, which was the jurisdiction of the church, and the questioning was primarily done by the, on the king's behalf. In a recovered document, the questioning revolved heavily around the initiation rites and rituals. In this document, the questions asked to this night and about a dozen others included, which are paraphrased, question one, were you led to a secret location, shown the cross and crucifix, and made to deny Jesus Christ three times? <gasps> three times. Christ, the Holy Virgin, and the saints, and to spit on the cross? Yes. Which is blasphemy. <gasps> oh, never mind. Question two, did the brother carrying out the initiation kiss you obscenely Ooh. on the base of your spine, <laughs> navel, and then on the mouth? <laughs> that sounds horny. I know. It's like, stop projecting, okay? <laughs> Did you, did you did you guys kiss? <laughs> did you kiss? Mm -hmm. you um, honest, don't worry about it. That's really bad, cool though. Here. <laughs> We're all friends here. Ignore where my hand is. Did you guys kiss? Question four. Did he participate in a chapter meeting where an idol of a bearded head, Baphomet, was worshipped? And question five. Did the priests of the order consecrate the host as other priests were instructed? Which is weird. Like, they did, did they not consecrate the way that they were supposed to? These questions insinuated severe charges for the medieval times. These type of questions were insinuating that the Templars had formed some sort of sexual cult and had <gasps> sexual initiation rites. Oh, no. And I thought Templar sex cult sounds like a good band name. Very. You know, when you have a good band name, you just it you just have to be like, that's a good name for a band. Also, feel free to use that. And also, they were worshiping weird idols. They were just they just made it seem like it was just some weird cult. After being threatened with torture, the particular Templar who was asked these questions denied only the last two, which is the idolatry parts. He'd rather admit to homosexuality rather than idolatry. This kept him from being tortured and also admit to the sins that can be forgiven by the church. The other dozen knights responded the same way. And all across France, they responded the same way under the threat of torture. And this led to thousands of Templars quitting the order en masse. However, no knights were executed during the first round of arrests. And the following year, in 1308, they added more crimes to the list. Uh, they did not believe in the sacraments, and the priests of the order did not consecrate the host. And they added that the Grand Master absolved the brethren of their sins, even though they are laymen. And the most telling was that the Templars sought gain for the order by whatever means, lawful or not. Chapter meetings and receptions were held at night and were in secret under heavy guard, and members who revealed the proceedings to an outsider was punished by imprisonment or death. Ooh. 
but like it's not that weird to have meetings and get togethers at night mm -hmm. <laughs> you know it, it seems normal to me like meeting up after the work day was over and not to reveal the inner goings on or things discussed in private meetings doesn't really seem sinister either no it seems pretty standard yeah so, i mean i guess most most places wouldn't say we'll kill you right but you know but they didn't <laughs> they were like made it up like there was a secret initiation yeah. order and and all that um all they had to do was take the vow of the of the rule the imprisonment and death things is a little far-fetched but again they were uh, accusations and not what was actually happening mm -hmm. so they weren't like as like we just said they weren't like throwing people they weren't killing them and throwing like they would kick them out of the order that was like or the worst they're not like they? killing I they're not they like were. killing people after reports of thousands of French Templars being questioned in France got out, other kingdoms started questioning their chapters as well. But it is important to note that questioning of knights in other countries led to no convictions, and they weren't conducted under the threat of torture like they were in France. There was never any proof that the Templars were doing what the French had accused the Templars of doing. Like, it's always the French, right? Pretty much. In turn, the church itself started its own investigations of the Templars. Because of the declared innocence of the Templars outside of France, the French Templars recanted their own admissions. But in the end, this was a bad idea because to be convicted of heresy, then recant your confession, meant you were a relapsed heretic. <gasps> and that was punishable by death. Oh, shit. From this, Philip IV gleefully, you I'm key, sure, you junkies. <laughs> uh, burned. 54 Templars at the stake. Jeez. And they were all high profile Templars and served as a warning. How'd they taste? <laughs> the Pope's investigation concluded in 1312. They determined that there was very little evidence that the Templars had any heretical beliefs, but the Pope still declined to formally end the order. It was thought that the accusations were so harmful that it was better to disband them and be done with it. Can't give in. But is there any truth at all in the accusations against the Templars? Yes. Jonathan Riley Smith, a Templar historian, found that during early pre-torture interrogations, there, there were knights who said that they had heard of other Templars spitting on the cross and denying Christ. But not them, of course, not them. It is thought that maybe this was a training tactic used to prepare the knights in case they were ever captured by Muslim soldiers, since it wasn't unusual that Muslim captors would make the Christians perform these heresies. Eventually, it might have turned into an initiation rite, which makes mm -hmm. sense. Mm -hmm. So, like, you might have to do these things, so we're just, we're just going to get it done with. We're so that you good at it. Yeah. Which I'm like, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that's not, like, makes sense to me. <laughs> All these notorious accusations against the Templars are most likely fabricated by Philip IV. Based on his record of accusing people he owed money to or needed to collect money from, of heresy and demon worship, he probably didn't believe any of it himself. All of these things he accused the Templars of was the same allegations he brought against other groups he persecuted, witches, Jews, and heretics. And one important fact that one of the podcasts I listened to point out is that usually when a religious sect is accused of being heretics, they are martyred and martyred, meaning people die willingly for their beliefs and not one Templar knight was martyred. Well, there you go. So that settles it. Take that, Philip the Fourth. Yeah, eat shit, Philip. Douche. <laughs> Another source that I read, uh, Sophia Menashe, suggests that the Templars were a failed ideal from the very beginning. The lay aristocracy was initially enthusiastic, which was obvious from their contributions of land and money. They were also willing to expand the ranks a great deal in the Holy Land. It is argued that support of the nobility was essential to the status of the temple. Even though the Pope and the ecclesiastical world hyped them up, it turns out that the Templars weren't always seen as a great cause. And support for the Templars wasn't universal or conclusive. As early as 1160, the Pope had to issue a bull to stop people from mistreating Templars, pulling them from their horses, treating them dishonestly, Jeez. and even abusing them. I guess it was kind of like bullied kids, like becoming police officers. <laughs> Going, I'm so, going to be a Templar. Like 95% police officers? Yeah. The Templars were heavily criticized in their time. They were disparaged by leaders of state and quite often ecclesiastical leaders as well. Ecclesiastical is a fancy word for religious. Mm -hmm. so. I know. Okay, just putting it Maybe, out there. I, I trust all no of judgment. our listeners to know. They're all brilliant, ecclesiastical scholars. Yeah, it's, it's 
it's a, a word a, a word for religious as it pertains to the church clergy and religious institutions so it's like that kind of thing and this was even before they entered banking and finance on a large scale and after they entered into that sphere that only fueled the idea of greed and avarice which had already affected their public image early on and was even more reprehensible because they had taken a monastic vow the ecclesiastics were resentful of their privileges and that encroached on the authority and the resources of the clergy and this resentment extended even to the pope who was the sponsor of all military orders pope innocent iii said that they used religion for worldly gain and misused their many privileges pope honorius iii accused oh, the english honorius accused the english templars of abusing many privileges <gasps> So That's like I when I when I'm pronouncing these things like I've only ever um read them and I'm like I don't say them out loud or really hear people saying them out loud so I don't really if I had to guess I think you're probably closer than most Americans right. would be. I hope so cuz I'm like really good at mm -hmm. reading. One of the ecclesiastical criticizers William of Tyre says that Quote, the order is said to have vast possessions, and there is not a province in Christendom that does not bestow some part of its possessions upon these brethren. Their property is said to equal the riches of kings. For a long time, they kept intact their noble purpose, but at length they began to neglect humility, the guardian of all virtues. Remember not, not to ever be proud. Don't ever be proud. Never, ever, 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 ever feel good about yourself, ever. You are a bad person. And Jesus died because of you. Yeah. Remember that. They withdrew from Jerusalem. Withdrew from with Jeru Jerusalem. With they withdrew Jerusalem, from whom they received the establishment of their order and refused him the obedience which their predecessors had shown him. To the churches of God, they became troublesome. They drew away from them their ties and unjustly disturbed their possessions. That's what that's what William said. That's what Bill said. Got it. The Templars' exemption from clerical patronage and ties became a source of resentment with the secular hierarchy and affected their dealings. A German priest, John of Würzburg, who traveled to the Holy Land around 1200, had a lot of things to say. He criticized that the Templars had much property and countless revenues. They gave considerably to the Christian poor, but not a tenth of what the Hospitallers did. William also goes on to accuse them of being bribed, to raise a siege he also accuses the hospitalers of this one he um accuses them of their offensives being motivated by plunder of being a threat to the entire crusader kingdom of delivering an egyptian sultan to his enemies in exchange for money even though he was on the verge of converting to christianity mm. he was on the verge and they just gave him back <laughs> he also had some harsh words for the late grandmaster of the time quote in whose nostrils dwelt the spirit of fury uh carrot top in the nostrils so how did the templars survive the entire century before they were violently disbanded with such criticisms their increasing importance to the financial role they played was what fueled their political status and ensured their survival their significant assistance to royal families was the built-in support that kept them alive it was the monarchs that benefited the most from their services. So despite all the criticisms they faced from the ecclesiastics, the Pope and the nobility, they could count on the kings to defend them. Not French though. Well, up until a certain point. However, increasing condemnation of the Templars opened a path for legitimizing Philip's actions against them, even though these arguments were scarcely explored during their prosecution. One thing I, I didn't find in my research which was hardly exhaustive was anyone accusing the templars of heresy rituals or the occult before philip's persecution mm. so at least not on a scale large enough to cause the concern yeah. that phil dredged up you know? pretty much just probably made it up yeah like the none of these rumors existed before he said something it wasn't like something he just jumped on the back of and was like yeah, yeah. Um, it's it more was just like, something he yanked straight out of his butthole yeah, yeah. So maybe he's the one with the, the ring with a demon in it, mm -hmm. not the Pope. And it was a cock ring. So, you know, the Templars, his, might, <laughs> Templars might have been accused of a lot of things. But as far as I can tell from the four or five academic resources I read, not what Philip accused them of. <laughs> like there are two French proverbs to drink like a Templar and to swear like a Templar. 
and a German word for a brothel was temple house. And at Famagusta, which is a city in Cy Cyprus, which doesn't sound like that's what it would be, but it was no. said that no girl is a woman until she has slept with a Templar. Now is the fun part. Oh, no. We weren't having fun before, were we? Because now, like, just hold on to your hats because now it's going to be fun. I'm going to hold on to my butt. The myths and the conspiracies. So why are the Templars in particular so easy to attach to conspiracy theories? Have you ever thought that? Why it's, the Templars? I, it's the main thing I think about most nights when I go to bed. Like, how are the Templars connected to this? Mm -hmm. <laughs> so really, um, the most succinct theories that I read said that since in the 21st century, elaborate espionage and the increasing interconnectedness of the world helps to create a widespread willingness to believe in long-term worldwide conspiracies. And that makes sense. Mm -hmm. Our culture in the 21st century just makes it so that we're open to things like this because we're like, oh, yeah, you know, the world is big and, you know, things have been around for a long time. <laughs> Um, probably the oldest myth slash conspiracies about the Templars involved the late Grand Master of the Templars. Um, the last Grand Master of the Templars was Jacques de Mulet. And aside... Jack the Mule. Uh, he was actually asked by Philip to be a pallbearer in a funeral the night before the Templars were, were accused. Hmm. Like, what a shady bitch. Philip, like, dude. <laughs> he really wanted these people's money. Yep. Like he has no scruples or no I, shame. He yeah. literally, he, the, the grand master, he's like, Hey, can you be a pallbearer at this funeral? And then the next day, like ar arrest him for heresy. Nice man. Because he was the last grand master, there has been a lot of lore centered around him. He was obviously pissed off that the order had been disbanded by the Pope. He made a lot of noise and proclaimed the accusations against the order were unjust and that he was innocent. And but this not Pope innocent. This obviously pissed off Philip, who had him executed in 1314 oh. as a relapsed heretic. Yeah. As he burned, it is said that he cursed his accusers that yeah. within a year, Philip and Pope Clement would both be dead, and they would have to answer to God for their crimes against the Templars. And they went on to live for another 300 years. It probably came from Italian, an Italian medieval chronicle, which was more like fiction than truth. Mm -hmm. And it like most writings in history. <laughs> it was attributed to an Italian knight with a little bit of flair added for spice. There is an epic poem called Parzival, written by Wolfram von Eschenbach, Ooh. between sometime between 1200 and 1210. And it was a 16 book, 25,000 line poem that was a religious allegory about Parzival's journey from ignorance to spiritual awareness. Isn't that what all the, the poems are oh, about? Oh, nice. And this little poem introduced the Holy Grail into German literature. Ah. Parzival wants to become a knight of the round table, but isn't found experienced enough. After many adventures, he becomes a knight and eventually becomes the keeper of the Grail. which the is grail? Which is guarded by a group of Templar-esque knights. <gasps> Who say me? But we have more about the Holy Grail in a minute. But note... This poem was written while the Templars were still in active order because it was in 1200. Mm -hmm. And that was really about it for the Templars mythos in the medieval age. Like that was about, that was like it. Like it was news. There was like a couple stories about the mule, <laughs> de mule. And then there was this poem about Templar S knights guarding the Holy Grail. And people were aware of them, but they held no significant cultural wonder as they do in modern history. Because while the Templars were active during their 200-year tenure, there really wasn't any mysticism attributed to them. It only came after the order was abolished. Now that they were eradicated, there was no one left to guard their legacy and also to disprove any allegations. So maybe there were some mystical secrets they were guarding because there's nobody to say no. Um, but I mean... Nah. So maybe they were a little magical. Nah. Maybe they knew things that would turn Christianity upside down. And then they told them to the guy who wrote those books that became movies with Tom Hanks, but I can't remember the name of <laughs> Da Vinci Code. The fall of the Templars was huge news, 
and and it cannot be overstated it was swift and severe it was uh, unexpected and maybe a little strange that all of a sudden these accusations were being thrown around about a respected religious order because as i said there really wasn't any kind of rumors or intrigue that suggested the templars were doing any of the things they were accused of and most chronicles depicted philip the fourth as greedy and spiteful as i mentioned but what worked in his favor were the accusations of idolatry, sodomy, secrecy, etc., because they were more appealing to the public than the criticisms they faced about their lackadaisical behaviors and secret treaties with the Muslims in the Holy Land. But after the initial news of the disbandment, there really wasn't much said about them for 400 years. And in the early 1700s, the interest in the Templars was renewed by a new movement known as the Freemasons. For the most part, the Freemasons Ooh. were a secret social club with Ooh. elaborate rituals and initiations. Yeah, I've never heard of them. Who are they? <laughs> it was formed in England by the new middle class, obviously only for men. It was comprised of lawyers and doctors and businessmen and was formed by these men since they were growing in influence, but largely kept out of power and places of prestige only held by aristocrats. The point of the club was to help out their fellow members in businessy business and such and they created lore about themselves allegedly they claimed that they were the descendants of the hospital order but then they found out that the order still existed so they switched to the templars and also they claimed that they were formed from the medieval masonry guilds so that's how it, that came about ah. guilds back in the day uh were crucial to the economy so like kind of like these freemason guys are like we're crucial too yeah so we need to protect ourselves and we need to make ourselves see like secret we do cool handshakes yeah we need a secret handshake so that we can be we can say the aristocrats like we're cool too you can't be in our club <laughs> no no girls or cooties allowed um and the masonry guilds were the protectors of the very important trade of architecture which in the middle ages went through a renaissance of sorts with the evolution of cathedrals and castles. So they were very important, the Masonry Guild. There is also nothing tying the Freemasons to the medieval Masonry Guilds, as you probably guess. And even further than that, they alluded that their order was even more ancient than the guilds. Ooh. They were the men who built the pyramids and also the Temple of Solomon. So that is how they connected themselves to the order of the Templars. Sure. What the Masons tell us is that when the Templars moved into the temple, when they were moving things and renovating, they found secrets and knowledge that had been buried by the builders of the temple <laughs> and maybe King Solomon himself. Oh. The Templars became the guardians of this knowledge, and over the centuries it was passed down and ended up in the hands of the Freemasons. Totally plausible. Definitely nothing like uh, magic underwear or golden plates from God. And, and this and also claiming that some of the Templars were also Freemasons. Oh, of course. But remember that the Templars were not living in the actual Temple of Solomon. They were headquartered at the Alaska Malls. So like they're, you know, they were never actually there. The first reported incident of Freemasons claiming Templar heritage in particular was a Scottish Freemason, Andrew Michael Ramsey. In 1737, he gave a speech in which he declared that Crusader Knights were Masons. Like, I guess. I, yeah, I mean, you can you can say whatever you want. Right. But he doesn't specify the Templars. He just said Crusader Knights were Masons. <laughs> the Pope at the time very swiftly condemned this speech, but this started a tradition of the Freemasons and creating fake history about the Templars. Around this time, relics and trinkets of the Templars started to mysteriously appear around Ooh. Europe. And these were like medallions and swords and were passed around the Freemasons. They were, are ornately decorated with jewels and crosses and elaborate designs. However, the actual Templars were forbidden from decorating their swords with ornaments. Like, remember the, uh, the Oath of Poverty? Mm -hmm. that they had to be poverty they had to live in poverty yes but the organization could live in opulence yes but they weren't going around decorating their swords with jewels and stuff like these magical templar swords were appearing that were all these encrusted. things are this is like old school clickbait yeah it's always been the same people are like oh nowadays it's so much worse now it is like no it's always been yeah. the same it's always the same just back then it was it was a paper or a chronicle or a pamphlet <laughs> that was the clickbait 
our, our, their clickbait was making a big jeweled sword instead of a normal one. Yes. But the bread and butter of Templar conspiracy as we know it is the Holy Grail. It's hard to talk about the conspiracy theories of the Templars without the Holy Grail. The Grail! The Grail! In 1818, pseudo-historical writer Joseph von Hammer Pergstoll leaned into the idea that the Templars were a secret society dedicated to mystical knowledge and relics and that they found some obscure knowledge from the Temple of Solomon. Then he wove this narrative together with the popular idea of the Arthurian Holy Grail. He explains that the Holy Grail symbolized the secret knowledge of the Templars that they held and that the Grail wasn't actually a Jesus cup. Mm. Up until this well, time... It? The Holy Grail had no connection whatsoever to the Templar lore. And now this is what we in modern day, in the modern day, come to think of when we think of the Holy Grail lore. Nothing up until 1818 Freemason inspired lore did the Holy Grail be mentioned alongside the Templars. Besides that little poem that was, you know, Templar-esque. Mm -hmm. But it, but now they're like, they're like, this is what the Templars did. Absolutely. It was their main purpose. They, they, they guarded the Holy Grail. They guarded it, did it. So the Grail was secret knowledge. It wasn't a cup. It was secret knowledge. That's what you asked that question, but I talked over you. Even though the Freemasons unapologetically invented their entire link to the Templars and embellished their history with fake history, it is the Freemason version of the Templars that colors our picture of them now in the modern age. It is being taken over by Ubisoft in their Assassin's Creed franchise, where we now all believe that they have been fighting the Assassins for you're taking 5, away years. you're taking away my future talking points oh shit <laughs> well that's fine because you know there's a lot there's a lot in and um pop i catch culture. everything in video games yeah i know like you'll you're gonna know all the video game things this lore heavily influenced an international best-selling book the holy blood and the holy grail i was waiting for you to say the da vinci code <laughs> that's, that's i was like in my head fill in the blank Okay, but The Holy Blood and The Holy Grail was written in 1982 by co-authors Michael ba Michael Butt stuff. <laughs> Michael Bygent. Oh. Is what I guess a it is. A gentleman. And he is a grand officer Freemason. Wow. How, how cool. Another author. What a cool dude. <laughs> You're cool, man. You're a Freemason. Wasn't your I don't really want one? I know. I was just going to say I don't really want to make fun of it because my <laughs> I mean, maybe he was maybe had fun there. That had some cool handshakes and drank some beer. I don't think it was something that he, that he, I don't think it was something he was heavily involved in. He wasn't protecting the grill. No, he, no, he wasn't. He was doing secret handshakes and, you know, fun initiation rites and being Having secret. stag parties. And, yeah. So the other two authors were Richard Lee and Henry Lincoln. And Henry Lincoln was a script writer for Doctor Who in the 60s. Uh -huh. And this book relied heavily on Templar conspiracy and went so far as to allude that it was actual history, which eh, we'll see later why they might have thought that. In this book, it was first suggested that Jesus had a relationship with Mary Magdalene <laughs> after the crucifixion. That's very Da Vinci Code. <laughs> Is it? Yeah. After the crucifixion, their child or children Ooh. was born and... <laughs> They emigrated to France, where her children mingled with noble families and Good eventually shit. became their Merovingian dynasty, which yep. lasted from 457 to 751. Or oh, that might not be Da Vinci Code. That might be like the Angels and Demons. One of his books just is all about the Merovingians. The real Holy Grail is simultaneously Mary Magdalene's womb and the sacred bloodline of Jesus. So it's two things. Okay. It's the womb and the bloodline. It's funny. The Holy Grail is the womb. Of Mary Magdalene. Mm -hmm. The child and the bloodline secret was protected by the Priory of Sion. The Priory of Sion was a secret society formed in 1099. 23 years later, the Templars were formed in Jerusalem. When they excavated under the Temple of Solomon, they found trunks of documents proving the truth of the Holy Grail. Everybody's finding all these things in the Temple of Solomon, which doesn't, which doesn't even exist where they thought it did. Like it mm -hmm. wasn't even there. Clickbait, man. The Priory defended Jesus' descendants' claim to the throne of France. And all of this was the secret knowledge of the Templars, as many <laughs> Templars were members of the Priory of Sion. Illustrious Grand Masters included Leonardo da Vinci and Isaac Newton. It is claimed that many of the Grand Masters had been important public figures in arts and literature. 
Why though? <laughs> why, why is all of this a mystical secret? Why that? The book tied all the various Templar lore together, and the end goal was the purpose of the Priory, to put Jesus' bloodline back on the throne of France, reinstate chivalric knighthood, and promote pan-European nationalism, and to establish a theocracy that ruled over all of Europe through a one-party parliament residing with the Priory. Oh, boy. And they're like, they want to reinstate chivalric knighthood, but that's what the Templars tried to distance themselves from that. You mm-hmm. know, they weren't they traditional. Were, they, they were trying to live the opposite of that. Yeah, they were. The, they weren't themselves. chivalric. They were warrior monks. You know, they 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 weren't um, regular knights. But whatever, you know, who cares about history? The Priory is also said to have created the Knights Templar as its military arm and financial branch. So the Templars were the ones working on this goal. And the King of France and the Pope heard about the plot. And that's why Philip ter- terminated the Templars. Really damn Templars and they're plotting with the and, prior you and, rem- and remember in line going. <laughs> this book is saying that this is real. You know, like they're not they're they're saying this is real history. That's what I was taught. In a 1982 review of the book, novelist and literary critic Anthony Burgess wrote, "It is typical of my unregenerable soul that I can only see this as a marvelous theme for a novel." Wink wink. <laughs> And it was the influence for Dan Brown's 2003 masterpiece, The Da Vinci Code. Uh, yeah. Masterpiece. So that's, this is where he got it all from. Uh-huh. But I'm proud to say I've never read it. For some it's reason. good pulp reading, but as a fan of history, you would probably dislike it. Yeah, that's it. what, you know, yeah, that's what they're like. It's good. It's a good fun read, but it's not. Real and then people history. really thought it was true when it came out. Yeah, I don't know why I decided not to read it when it came out. Probably because I was just. I, I I don't know. It just like sounded dumb. It's very dumb. So it's one of those books that's you really gotta like just give in and accept these stupid things as yeah. being smart in the context of the the plot. Yeah. So the Da Vinci Code is basically the theories in Holy Blood, but repurposed. At the time of publishing, Dan Brown vehemently argued that he believes what the book says and that it was exhaustingly researched and very accurate. Yeah. because it's based on holy blood mm-hmm. he doubles down in the foreword multiple interviews and on his website a year later so like two, about 2004 his website said that his theories have merit and that each reader needs to come to their own interpretation and then we're hedging our bets because we know it's really stupid probably pr is like dan like chill out a little bit <laughs> He says in interviews that his wife is an art historian and Da Vinci fanatic, so he had a leg up, and he learned about Da Vinci's involvement in the Priory while researching in Seville. The New York Daily News said that his research is impeccable, and the Chicago Tribune said it contained several doctorates worth of fascinating history and learned speculation. So at least they didn't say it was actual history. Yeah. So it kind of like pulled the wool over, you know, major publications. Um, I don't know. I just that can't. intimates that major publications actually have people that know what they're talking about most of the time, and they don't. Yeah, like people like I work for the New York Times, and it's like okay, and you know, like doesn't mean that you're. I guess it makes you more legitimate, but it's you know, it's just I don't know. Most of the times, it just Elitism. means that you had a rich or famous parent. Many of Brown's research discoveries are easily debunked, especially <laughs> those involving Da Vinci, who is, I assume, obviously the center of the book, since it's what it's called. He's a big part of it, yeah. You know, but shout out to Da Vinci for leaving us so many clues. <laughs> he just couldn't stop himself from making sure someone in the future discovered the truth. And they lasted for like 600 years. As for the Templar involvement, he claims that the Templars built Gothic cathedrals, that the model for these cathedrals is the human vagina, and he says the internal symbol of the vagina is the rose, and that the rose is an anagram for Eros, the god of love, and somehow this contributes to the evidence that Mary Magdalene was Jesus' wife. (laughs) Mm -hmm. Yeah, sure. Yeah. He also claims the Templars built Rosalind Chapel, another Rose reference, but the chapel was built 125 years after the dissolution. But if they were still a secret society, then it is they proof. Se- they, they were secret. They were Masons at that point. To, but the Masons were super secret because they had been Templars, and the Templars get all beat up 
and said, you're heretical jerks and we're going to burn you. It's like, <laughs> oh, we will now go into Hadin and we will be the prior de say, oh, And no, we will what? build churches based on roses, based on vaginas. We gigantic cathedrals because we are... We understand the masonry, no? <laughs> we built vagina churches, but but you know if they were you know if they were secret, how do you know how would we know if they built it or mm-hmm. not? You know, how secret. do you know that there isn't a pizzeria in New Jersey that is the head of the Democrats' um, secret child trafficking ring? You know, it's I mean, a every, secret. everybody knows that. Like everybody knows mm-hmm. the Templars, you know, based everything on vaginas. Mm-hmm. Two of the authors of Holy Blood did unsuccessfully sue Random House over the publication of the Da Vinci Code. Claims included plagiarism of their original historical hypothesis, extensive use of their research, copied their list of grandmasters without acknowledgement. A character's name is an anagram of two of the author's names. (laughs) The villain, which was the eccentric English historian, Lee (laughs) Teabing. So that was the... Uh, anagram of two of the author's names. Wow, and, no one could ever figure that out, Dan. Way to go. And Lee and Lee Teabing has the same physical description as the third author who walks with a limp. And the funniest part is that the Da Vinci Code mentions Holy Blood and alludes it is a major contributor to its hypothesis. But Sir Teabing says, <laughs> can't say that one. Sir Teabing, <laughs> the authors made some dubious leaps of faith in their analysis, but their fundamental premise is sound. Ah. Oh, thank you, Mr. Daniel Gerhard Brown. That's what Brown. Bing says. He's T-Bing. from New Hampshire. I wonder why he's so dumb. The I pub- mean, he's great. Shh. The pu- <gasps> don't, he got divorced we don't from, say people are dumb around here. He got divorced from his wife. Did you know that? Who? Dan Brown. Oh, well, of course, yeah. because who could live with somebody like that? <laughs> The publication of the Da Vinci Code significantly increased sales for Holy Blood, and the court ruled that since Holy Blood was published as history, it could be freely interpreted. So that backfired. Mm -hmm. (laughs) You want to call it history, that means people are open to use your premise. But it might not be entirely the author's fault that Holy Blood turns out to be pseudo-history but they still did lean into it hardcore. But I read that while the authors were doing research following their production of a documentary series for the BBC called The Chronicle, so they were researching for this documentary was when they found what they based their hypothesis on. So they came across a pseudo-historical document widely considered to be a forgery at the time. And it's called the Dossier Secrets de Henri Labenau. And that had been deposited anonymously in the French National Library in 1967. The document alleged to detailing hundreds of years of medieval history, including the Priory of Sion. It also included a genealogy that showed one of the authors to be a descendant of a Merovingian king. The author was Pierre Plantard, and he registered the Priory of Sion as an organization in 1956. And he later claimed to be the Grand Master from 1981 to 1984. Uh, By the way, Plantard was an extreme right-wing anti-Semite. And when the French government was collapsing in 1957, he tried to gain a position of power in esoteric and monarchist circles by claiming ancestral connections. In 1993, under questioning by a judge, Plantard admitted he fabricated the story, founded the Priory of Sion, and forged the documents with a colleague. And this forged dossier is considered proof of Brown's and the Holy Blood's author's theories. Other documents that all these authors cite as proof do not exist at all or have mysteriously disappeared. So so Holy Blood got all of its quote unquote history based on this forged document by this guy that just wanted to make himself um, better than he was. He was trying to take advantage of the collapse of the government and being like, hey, I'm a descendant of a king. Look at this genealogy yeah. um, that he wrote. <laughs> However, the authors of Holy Blood said that only through speculative, quote, synthesis can one discern the underlying continuity, the unified and coherent fabric, which lies at the core of any historical problem. To do so, one must realize that it is not sufficient to confine oneself exclusively to facts. Yes. Facts are stupid. Just Agreed. Wild speculation is so much more fun. You know, like you have to be able to discern the underlying continuity and the unified and coherent fabric. Like one must be attuned to these 
<laughs> underlying facts. Yes. Not exclusive facts, underlying facts. You've got to be willing to just accept the bull. Quoting Robert McCrum, literary editor of the Observer newspaper about holy blood, there is something called historical evidence. <laughs> there is something okay. called the historical method. And if you look around the shelves of bookshops, there is a lot of history being published and people mistake this type of history for the real thing. These kind of books do appeal to an enormous audience who believe them to be history, but actually they aren't history. They are a kind of parody of history. He also goes on to say he sees this as the direction history is going today, but I, I disagree with that. There have always been people writing yeah. and presenting fake history. And there's but, always been people that are saying, man, things used to be so much better. But now it finds a wider audience. So it, he's all like, this is where history is going. And it's like, no, this is just more people see this bullshit. Mm -hmm. And the authors of Holy Blood compared themselves to the reporters who uncovered the Watergate scandal. <laughs> sure. All right. So jumped ahead back then the templars are featured in pop culture today including books obviously movies songs and they make a great story for a video game which we love video games mm -hmm. and i lifted these descriptions right from wikipedia so spoiler alert <laughs> um have you ever heard of gabriel knight 3 blood of the sacred blood of the damned i can see the templar as being a good subject for a point and click adventure game oh yeah you know it, it, like it's fun um, it features an alternate version of the Grail interwoven with the mythology of the Knights Templar. The Holy Grail is revealed in the story to be the blood of Jesus Christ that contains his power, oh, only accessible to those descended from him. With the vessel of the Grail being defined as his body itself, which the Templars uncovered in the Holy Lands. So okay. like Jesus, zombie, blood, power? Yeah, and you can turn water into wine. You can walk on water. You can. Oh, those are the powers in the game? Those are the powers in the game. Oh, I have no idea. I'm just saying oh. what Jesus can do. <laughs> Not like, if it, I thought those if were like. If there's a woman named Mary Magdalene, you can make her pregnant. You can walk on water. You can make a bunch of loaves and fishes feed more people. I thought you lo looked up the game and saw like some of Gabriel Knight's powers were turning water into wine. And <laughs> um, Persona 5 in 2016, the I Holy Grail is the treasure of the game's final palace. Oh, representing yeah. the combined desires of all humanity for a higher power to take control of their lives and make a world that has no sense of individuality. It's a weird game. So like what the alt-right wants now. <laughs> Pretty much. Or right wing. Is that Persona 5 or Persona 5 Royal? It must just... Royal added more, so now it's no longer the final area of the game. They added a new special area that you can only get to if you do certain things. Got to make a teacher real happy. I don't know anything about Persona. I just, I, I, I know, but I still don't know anything about it. It's a JRPG. I like the song. I like the song yeah. that they had the voice actor sing. That was Great a cute music. Song. Oh, no, that's AI, the Somnium Files. Oh. Mm -hmm. Persona I, 5 is. Uh, well, they're both uh, JRPGs. So. Very different, though. Uh, AI, the Somnium Files, more point and click. Uh, Persona, more like turn based action. But a good game, and it's on Game Pass. Are you ready for the Assassin's Creed video game franchise? There's like fuck. There's like 19 things in there. Well, that. tell me if I'm wrong because this is what Wikipedia says, or Wikipedia what I what I pasted. That, I played them all, but Wikipedia would know more than me. What I what I pasted together from a couple things mm -hmm. though, because they almost sounded it's, like they didn't make sense. It's crazy. The Templars have been slowly taking over the world for centuries. In the original mm -hmm. game. The one Templar refers to the main relic of the game as the Holy Grail, although it was later discovered to be one of the many apples of Eden. The Templars... The pieces of Eden from the original apple of Eden. Oh, these, they... these pieces so... all make up the apple. And Oops. if you got these pieces, you've got the power of the Isu. Okay. okay. And the Templars turn out to be evil, using people to find powerful artifacts to make them more powerful. And they use video games to find their victims, but the Brotherhood of Assassins fight to keep the Templars from the artifacts and from mind controlling the world. Yeah, the, the Templar organization is known as Abstergo in the modern times, and they make video games and they are yeah, modeled they use, off of Ubisoft. Because... Yeah, they use they plug the people in so that they find but is but in, this isn't all revealed until like later in the franchise, right? Like this isn't You get uh, you get some of it in one and two. And those games but they are so kind of like feel like we're snowball anything. it into a bigger thing right they just kept making it bigger and bigger and bigger and eventually there's like nice templars you actually play a templar in assassin's creed black flag which is one of I the mean, best ones not all templars um in indiana jones and the last crusade the knights guarding the holy grail was actually the brotherhood of the cruciform sword mm. so not 
Templars, but his white tabard with a red cross is clearly meant to invoke Templar. The Templars make a good theme for a story, as we discovered with the two most famous ones earlier, but there are other books such as Umberto Eco's Foucault's Pendulum that centers around the phenomenon of the Templars' involvement in conspiracy theories, as we touched upon earlier, and he pokes fun of this by having his characters create absurdly complex literary Templar conspiracy that leads to their own destruction. <laughs> so it's basically just making fun of all the uh, yeah. conspiracies. And he's a good author. He's the one that wrote The Name of the Rose, the one that was the mm -hmm. monastery uh, murder mystery. Yeah, so Sean he, Connery. Yeah, he writes good. He writes good stuff. I'm going to read that now because I didn't know he, he wrote a Templar conspiracy parody. The 21st century view of the Templars restore the superhuman status they enjoyed in the Middle Ages while adding on top of that the power they have for either good or evil. In their time, they did have secrets, which was a necessary function of their role as military strategists, ambassadors, and bankers to kings. But modern depictions favor their penchant for secret keeping over their historical actions in the Crusades. One could even think that the Jedi Order in the High Republic was kind of based on the Templars. Really? I mean, they were a bunch of warrior monks who were helping government. Yeah, I guess so. And then they, they based mm -hmm. their plot on the hero's journey. Mm-hmm which is kind of like Percival. Yes. I don't know. I forget who Percival is. So they are connected to relics that hold actual power. They are keepers of secrets that will change the world someday. They are creating cryptic clues and quests to hold their secrets and then revealing them to the right people at the right time. And somehow will always find the first key to unlock their secrets because they just have to have the secret completely guarded <laughs> and also capable of being revealed because of the reasons. They are the they best just, planners of all time. They had to do this. They knew that just the right person in the future would find it and they would connect all the clues. And they just had to leave them there because for they some had reason. time travel and they knew that's how it was going to work out and they were uh, essentially slaves to fate. So now we're going to get a little darker. No, oh, no. In 1933, German writer Otto Rahn published a series of books tying the Grail, Templars, and Cathars to modern German nationalist mythology. I actually think it's Cathars. The Cathars were a dualist Gnostic movement in the Middle Ages and were considered heretical. They believed the good God was the New Testament God and the bad God was the Old Testament God. I mean, that's... Of course. That's not that crazy. The Jew God. He's bad. Well, I mean, the, old, the God in the Old Testament was pretty mean. He was bad. <laughs> he was actually bad. He I mean, New Testament isn't great, but he's nicer than Old Testament for sure. Yeah. And so Otto believed in a link between the oldest reference to the Holy Grail, which is the Germanic poem, Percival, and the Cathar Grail mystery, the belief that the Grail is held somewhere in or under the Cathar castle. The Catharsal. The Catharsal. Ron's most recognized works are The Crusade Against the Grail in 1933 and Lucifer's Court in 1937. Ron uses the Grail as a symbol of a pure Germanic religion repressed by Christianity. Heinrich Himmler, who was already oh fascinated by the occult and had initiated research of the Grail in southern France, Grail. recognized Ron and had Ron join his staff. Himmler at one point sponsored Ron's search for the Grail. He fell out of favor due to being openly gay and mingling in anti-Nazi circles. So he redeemed himself. Yeah. He was assigned guard duty at the Dachau concentration camp and eventually resigned Dachau. from the SS. Yeah, I don't know. Dachau. And eventually resigned from the SS in 1939 when he learned the Nazis were after him. He vanished and was found frozen to death on oh. a mountainside in Austria. Oh. So at least he realized, like, yeah. Ooh, this isn't that so great. Oh boy, these guys. Uh, He's like, they these want guys to pay really suck. They want to pay for me to find the Grail, but they were too much cost. <laughs> Ron's books inspired many subsequent conspiracy theories and fictional works about the Nazis searching for the Grail. So, like, Indiana Jones wasn't one hundred percent wrong. Mm -hmm. they, the Nazis were looking for the Grail, for real. <laughs> I separated. They were pretty stupid. I separated this part out from the rest of the fictional stories because the extreme right with their roots in Nazism has been dubbed by some academics, one in particular, Ariel Koch, as the new crusaders. Uh oh. The extreme right is just repackaged crusaders, basically. Like, um, yep. you know, if you really think about it. 
like imagine a world we live in now and the entirety of European peoples just decided to march towards the Middle East and gathering people along the way to attack the Muslims there. If that happened today, it would be the extreme right, anti-Semitic, anti-immigration people doing it. Pretty much. As Koch reported, there were several hundreds of volunteer anti-ISIS fighters in the Middle East and a surprisingly large number of those who identified as religious were Christians and a small number were Muslim. So there were many Christian volunteers fighting in Iraq and Syria, and it's not that far of a reach to assume that some of them were right with right wing stances. And given she didn't give the numbers, but it makes sense. And besides actual right wing volunteers fighting Muslims in the Middle East, the modern crusader is an Internet crusader. Yeah. <laughs> capital I, capital C, Internet crusader. These groups that function mainly online meet extremism with religion and called cumulative extremism. In this case, religious extremism. Mm. So they are fighting against Muslims trying to conquer Europe as their ancestors did, like the Iberian Peninsula, um, Ottoman Turks in Eastern Europe. And back then, it was always an alliance of Christians that stopped them. Ah. They use crusader symbolism for motivation, religious awakening, and moral justification of violence, propaganda, recruitment, and mobilization. It's a real-life cosplay. Yeah. And then we have the KKK. Oh, Their boy. use of the Templars motif is purposeful and not new. They have a paper called The Crusader. In 2016, three men called themselves The Crusaders and were arrested planning attacks on Muslims. <laughs> Other organizations use the Cross of St. George, crusader slogans and insider memes that use the images of templar knights in 2011 norwegian pan-european nationalist anders bering brevik called himself a justicar knight commander for the knights templar europe yeah and he wrote a 1500 page manifesto in london which mentioned christian 2247 times Crusade, 263 times, Knights Templar, 195 times, and Christendom, 119 times. He then murdered 77 people. 69 were members of the Labor Party's youth wing. I never heard of this. Yeah, it was real bad. I, I'm surprised you hadn't heard of that one. I It didn't ring I a bell. They were on an island or something. Yeah. yeah. So, honestly, the, the Templars of, of yore were religious extremists. They pledged their lives to fight in the Holy Land, not just protecting pilgrims. They also fought Muslims in defense of Christianity. And I bet 100% that modern right-wingers wished they could revive the Templar order with wealth, power, influence, and righteous in their cause. It all, you know, it all ends up to the alt-right, this kind of thing. But really, the Crusaders were alt-right back then. <laughs> you know, their version of alt-right. Yeah, so a long winding meandering history of the templars and i thought people might find it interesting to know what they were exactly back in in yeah, compared in to their day compared what to what they're seen so as much. yeah compared to what they are seen as now how they are interpreted now i thought it was very interesting like, i did too templars are are a messy business <laughs> mm -hmm. they're messy bitches yeah so we ended it on a good note with the alt right um <laughs> so where else can we go from there yeah I hope everybody has a good day and the sources are listed in the description. <laughs> well, thank you, Amanda. That was very interesting as always. I know it's been a while since we've been on. Uh, life's been super busy in many different ways, but uh, hopefully we were gone, but not forgotten. Hopefully the five people out there that are looking forward to this will have enjoyed I bet the episode. We'll get at least five views. Yeah. I'll bet my own nothing on it. I don't want to bet. Anything I will bet on. nothing on it. <laughs> But yeah, thank you so much, and hopefully we will be back sometime soon. Bye. Bye. Bye.